Who put Tosh in the front row? <laughs> so y'all, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really honored. Kim, thank you for the invite. I'm really grateful for that. And uh, Trevon and Eric Mann, what a, what's, that's amazing. The sun also rises. Sound familiar? Farewell to arms. For whom the bell tolls. The old man in the sea. Anyone recognize those titles? Hemingway. Yeah, if you're a reader, if you've paid attention in high school, or if you've even watched a little bit of Jeopardy, <laughs> you would know that this was, these are titles written by one of the greatest writers in the 20th century, uh, Ernest Hemingway. But here's what's interesting. Ernest Hemingway died a very depressed, lonely man. You know why? One of the reasons was because he believed that he had not created his life's work. Can you imagine? For whom the bell tolls was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. The old man in the sea won the Pulitzer Prize. And by 1954, he had won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He killed himself because he believed he hadn't accomplished his life's work. It was unfinished. During World War II, British author J.R.R. Tolkien, sound familiar? During World War II, he was contemplating death, not, not taking his life. He was contemplating whether he would survive the war. Germany was coming down hard on Britain, and he was wondering would he make it through but he was also consumed with the thought, would he die before finishing his life's work? By the, by the time he's having this struggle, he had already written some of the titles you would be very familiar with. And yet he was wondering, did he finish? <coughs> you know, in America, we have a mindset, don't we? It's a task-oriented mindset. We got to get stuff done. Anyone relate to that? <laughs> Darn Americans. <laughs> we want to get it done. We have a job to do, and we're going to get it done. And, and oftentimes, we will get that job done at the expense of people because we have a task-oriented mindset in the West. But in countries and, and continents like Latin America, in the Middle East, in the Far East, they have a relationship-oriented culture. It doesn't mean that the job's not important. What it means is that the relationship and your standing within the community actually matters. This is why you often hear uh, someone in Japan uh, may have failed in a task and they end up taking their life. Why? Because of the shame, not the task, the shame it brought the family, the, the relationship culture. Task oriented mindset. Did we get the job done? Did we finish relationship-oriented culture? I think we struggle with this in our culture, don't we? I think if we're honest, we struggle with this in the church. Did you get enough done? I, I work for the church, so I can say this. <laughs> the days I feel the best about my work is the days I got the most done. That's really telling, isn't it? Not about necessarily the relationships around me, but about the to-do the to -do list was enough checked off. Because if enough was checked off, then I did a good job, which means I'm a good worker, which means I'm a good person, which means I have approval from people. What's more prestigious? Think about this. Speaking in front of a group of a small, small group, five people, or speaking in front of a stadium? If I were to tell someone, hey, I'm speaking tonight in front of five people, people would be like, what, you couldn't get more? But if I said, hey, I'm speaking tonight at a stadium, they'd be like, wow, you're important. And that mindset, it carries over in everything that we do. And I think we put all this pressure on ourselves to perform, to produce, to get the job done, to finish. Am I alone up here or does anyone relate to this? You know, sometimes the task is actually that important. Sometimes the job to get done 
uh, is, is that important. And sometimes not finishing it is unacceptable. That's where we find Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln stood in, in what's now known as the famous Gettysburg Address, and as he stood on the very grounds where tens of thousands of men had lost their lives, he challenged his hearers to this. He, he wanted them to be dedicated to the unfinished work. And what was the unfinished work? Well, if you listen to the rest of the speech, the unfinished work was that this nation would be under God and have a, a new birth of freedom because the task of ending slavery was that important to him. You know, we put the pressure to perform and to finish the work, and I think we do this in Christian circles. We, we have this, this calling from God sometimes, and we feel like my life's work is this or that, and we have this intense pressure that we put on ourselves that we've got to finish the job. But I want to suggest to you tonight that that pressure is not from God. And I, and I think I, I speak on the authority of God's Word because if you, if you remember when Paul, who the Apostle Paul, he's sitting in a Roman or in an Ephesus jail, he's chained to a, a Roman soldier, and he's writing on God knows what to get a message out to the people of God, and he, and he writes this. He says, being confident of this, he who began a good work in you, he will carry it on to completion. He does the work. And I think we forget that, don't we? I don't know about you, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty important in my own mind. A lot of times. A lot of times I think that the work I'm doing is that important and I'm the only one that can get it there. I start to believe that. Do you believe that? I do. And then I, and then I read the Bible and I go, wait a minute. Paul was confident that he who began a good work in me, he's the one that's going to carry it to completion. That takes all the pressure off me. Yes. It, you know, Kim doesn't have to uh, make this auditorium filled with people. She's not called to do that. She's called to simply hold space. I'm a, I'm a youth pastor at my church. I'm not called to have the biggest youth group. That's, that's not my calling. My calling is to hold space for really important kids that show up and love on them and say, hey, you matter. And why? Because he who began a good work, he's going to do the work. He's going to carry completion. So we live in a world, if you haven't noticed yet, we live in a world where... It's a world of finishers. You're, you're rewarded if you finish, if you complete, if you produce. But God isn't really looking for finishers because he finishes, right? Yes. He's looking for people to be faithful. Faithful. I think about a story that was told by the former governor of Oregon, Mark Hatfield. He was touring a place called Calcutta. He was visiting Mother Teresa, if you remember her, and she was uh, working at what was called the House of Dying. This is where sick children across uh, Calcutta, they were cared for in their very last days. And the poor would line up by the hundreds to receive medical attention. So this former governor of Oregon, he's with Mother Teresa, and he's watching Mother Teresa minister to all these sick people. I mean, just this, this throng of sick people feeding and nursing those left by others to die. And he says this, how can you bear the load of this responsibility without being crushed by it? And she replied, my dear senator, that's what he was at the time, I'm not called to be successful. I'm called to be faithful. There was a boy in Michigan. He uh, was invited by a neighbor to go to VBS. So he went. The bus driver came and picked him up on a Sunday, and he went to this little VBS program that we were holding on a Sunday morning at the church, and they got him home. The next week, he went again, and again, and again. 400 Sundays, he had gone back to this church, picked up by the same bus driver. 400 Sundays. 
And it was on the 400th Sunday that he finally said, you know what? This Christianity thing, I think I'm going to surrender my life to it. What if the bus driver stopped at the 395th time? What if, what if the invitation stopped after the 100th time? That boy gave his life to Christ and then became a pastor and a world-renowned theologian who ended up spending his dying days here in Charlotte, Dr. Norman Geisler. Isn't that incredible? You know why he came to Christ? Because of faithfulness. There were people who were faithful in his life. And God loves faithfulness. I don't know if you know that. God loves faithfulness. In fact, he dedicates an entire chapter of the Bible to the stories of people who are full of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. If you have a Bible in your phone or in front of you, turn to Hebrews 11. I'm going to fly through it because of lack of time. But we find that in this chapter, in Hebrews chapter 11, over 20 times the phrase is, by faith. By faith. It's like God's telling this story to say, I want you to get it. It's not about by production. It's not about by your to-do list. It's about by faith. In verse 7, he talks about Noah. You know about Noah, right? Built the ark. You know what Noah's faith was credited for? Is that he listened to a warning about things not yet seen. That, that's, it, he, wasn't, he wasn't credited for his faith because he built the ark. And he was credited because he listened to this warning about something he had no idea about. And God said, I'm going to mention you in the, in the hall of fame of faith in my Bible. You go to verse 8. Abraham. You know what Abraham was known for? It's, it's in there. By faith, he walked in a direction he was unfamiliar with. I do that all the time. <laughs> I, didn't, I thought it was being lost. Apparently, God's like, hey, I'll give you credit for having faith. <laughs> Verse 11, Sarah, Abraham's wife. You know what she was credited for? She believed God could do what she thought was impossible. She didn't need to give birth to an entire nation. She just had to believe that God could do it. Verse 20, verse 21, Isaac and Jacob, they're mentioned. You know why they're mentioned for their faith? Because they gave a blessing. I don't know about you, but I, I always think about faith has got to be like this humongous thing. Like it's got to be so big in order to impress God that if my faith isn't like this massive thing, there's no way God's going to be happy with that. And you know why I think of that? Because I grew up in a task-oriented culture. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not rewarded for tiny little things in my to-do list. It's like, no, I've got to save the world. And then I've got to cure cancer. And I've, I've got to do all these things in my head that I think are so big. And God's not interested in me being this big finisher. He's just saying, Rob, be faithful. Be faithful in the little things. Just drive a bus. Just drive a bus. I know there's kids in there. Just drive that kid to church 400 times. Moses. Moses is mentioned in the book of faith. In verse 23, um, well, Moses' parents were actually mentioned first. Moses' parents were mentioned, and you know what their, their great act of faith were? They hid a baby. <laughs> now, I'm not recommending you just grab babies and hide them and be like, hey, God, look, there's my act of faith. But they hid Moses because they didn't want Moses to be taken and killed, if you know the story. Then Moses is mentioned in the same chapter, in verse 24, for his great act of faith. And his great act of faith is, is simply this. He refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And God's like, there's faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho. You know the walls of Jericho? Y'all can't even appreciate the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho were so thick. They were, it was an impenetrable fortress. There's no way. I mean, our own military would have had a hard time taking it down, literally. And they were told to walk around. That was all they were told to do is walk. And it says in this chapter, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the, mar the army marched around it for seven days. That's a ridiculous battle strategy. <laughs> but God wasn't calling them to take out the wall, 
He just says, go walk. That's all I want you to do is walk. Rahab. Yeah. Rahab. Yeah, Rahab was a prostitute. <laughs> For all you prostitutes out there, I want you to listen. Rahab was a prostitute, y'all. There's a lot of churches that would think, nah, she, she's not going to be mentioned in this, this chapter. She's not going to be mentioned as a person of faith. You know what her great act of faith was in Hebrews chapter 11? She welcomed the spies. There was a bunch of spies, a couple spies, and she just welcomed them into her home. And God was like, boom. It's like... It's like Oprah. Oprah's like, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. And God's like, what? You welcome spies? You get some f- a blessing. What? You hit a baby? There, you get some. And he's going on all these things that you would think have to be so big, and God's like, no. No, your faith can be actually like that. Just, just welcome a spy, and I'm going to count you in this chapter. Just hide a baby. I'm going to give you credit in this chapter. Just believe that I'm going to provide you a kidney and I'm going to give you some credit. The chapter ends by saying this. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah or about David, or Samuel, or the prophets. The writer of Hebrews is literally, he's just going on like a, like a rap, like a rap artist, and he's going, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. He's just getting this little, this little cadence going, and then he gets down to verse 32, and he's like, y'all, I'm out of a beat. I don't have time. I don't have time to tell you about all the rest of these, these people in the Bible that showed a little bit of faith and God's going to give him credit for it. And here's what, here's what it says. It says, these people, the people I don't have time to tell you about, they wandered in deserts. They wandered in mountains. They lived in caves. And they lived in holes in the ground. I would like to suggest that some of us relate to that. Do you ever wander in a desert? Yeah. May not be a literal one, yeah. but I think some people in the sound of my voice have wandered in some spiritual deserts. Yeah. They've been struggling through the mountains. They've been living in caves. They've been living in holes in the ground. Does that sound like some of us tonight? I think if we're honest... We can identify with that. And here's the thing. The church oftentimes doesn't allow us to be honest. And it starts with the people who work at the church because the people who work at the church aren't honest. We're not allowed to be honest. And I think we have to start getting honest because you know what? God already knows. He knows you're in a hole in the ground. He knows you're living in a cave. He knows you're struggling through the desert. He just wants you to admit it. The writer of Hebrews, he says this about these types of people. He doesn't, he's not worried about people who are finishing. He's not worried about people who are getting the job done. He's totally focused on the people who are just faithful, faithful in the little things. And this is what he says in verse 38 about these types of people. This is what he says about you about me. He says, the world is not worthy of them. I spend my entire to-do list trying to be worthy by the world's standards, and God's like, forget it. Just forget it. Don't worry about that. I'm not calling you to finish your to-do list before you die. Whatever your greatest life's work you think is, it doesn't matter. If you finish that, I'm going to finish it. If I called you to it, I'm going to make sure it gets finished. All I want you to do is do the next right thing. The next small thing. 
It doesn't have to be big, people. Verse 39 says, They were all commended for their faith, and yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for them. Man, it's powerful, isn't it? I love the Bible. But here's what's cool. We talk about Western people being more task-oriented, right? They want to get the job done. We talk about Eastern people, people with an Eastern mindset and upbringing, they're more people-oriented. They want to make sure that the relationships are still intact. And if you grew up in the West like I did, like most of us probably did, if you grew up in the West, in America, in Great Britain, whatever, you might be more task-oriented. And if you grew up in the Middle East or the Far East or in the East period, you might be more relationship-oriented. But what if you never grew up? What if you had always been? And, and this, is what, this is what's so powerful. Christ understood both mindsets. He understood what it was like to have a task so important it had to get done. But he also understood that there was relationships that were in the mix that were critical to keep in mind. And that's why in the person of Christ, he perfectly represents both mindsets, both worldviews, because he came to earth to get a job done. It was on his to-do list, if you remember, save the world. And yet, there was a people to redeem. There were relationships that had to be, they were fractured and they had to be brought together again. He had a work that he had to do, and he couldn't leave it unfinished. And we couldn't finish it. We couldn't finish it. That's why when the Bible tells us in John chapter 19, when he had received the drink of water while he's on the cross, he, he literally says, it is finished. So we don't ever have to wonder, is that to-do list still on my list? Do I have to somehow figure out a way to be worthy enough in God's eyes that, that I'm okay? And Jesus is like, I got that. I came to do that to-do list. All I'm asking you to do is be faithful. That's why the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 10. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And because he's faithful, we can be faithful. And our faithfulness matters, even in small things. <clears throat> I um, Years ago, I was speaking at my church. They uh, let me do the, the Sunday morning sermon, right? So the Sunday morning, I'm preaching at my church. <laughs> Shocking, I know. I'm preaching at my church, finished the sermon. Amazing applause that day. They just, no. <laughs> I don't know what I talked about. Finish the sermon. I go home. Next day is Monday. And um, I go to my, my mailbox <clears throat> and uh, open up the mailbox, and there's a letter from the electric company. So I open it up, and it's probably a bill, you know, get those. And when I opened up the statement, on the statement was a, um, clearly there was like a, it was a charge that they had charged me. It was like an extra $100 or so that was on my statement. That, and the reason I know this is because the month before, the same thing had happened. And I, had, and I spent hours. You know how it is you call these people on some 800 number, and it's some faraway person, and you're like arguing with them about how like, hey, look, there's this charge, and I'm legit, and you can't, whatever, and you fight. Well, it took forever to get this, this last month. It took forever to get this charge off. So here I'm going to the next month, I'm going to the mailbox, and again, the same charge is on there, and I'm like, I'm like really angry. Can I be honest? Yeah. I'm really angry, because it, it took a while to deal with the last one. So there's, a, there's an 800 number, right, on these things that you can call and talk to a customer service person? Yeah. So I, I called. Oh, Yeah. And I'm on hold longer than I want to be. And, I'm, and as I'm on hold, do you ever feel this? Like you're, yeah. you're building up this anger. Like you're just frustrated and there's no place for it to go. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I, I remember, I mean, I remember distinctly having this feeling like there was like this little angel on one side and devil on the other and be like, just be nice to them. Kill them. <laughs> you know, like consider the lilies. And then you're like, I'm going to overturn your table if you let me come over. So I'm going back and forth in my head about how I'm going to respond to this customer service person who's greatly inconveniencing my life. Finally get to talk to this lady. I'm assuming she's in Singapore or wherever they are. I don't know where these people are, but she's, she's far away, right? So she, she's super nice. She resolves the issue, and she says, uh, Mr. Arders, is there anything else that I can do for you today? And I was, I can't even tell y'all how close I was to letting her have it. I mean, I mean letting her have it. And I, y'all, I, I'm like a Christian, you know, like uh, I work for a church, but I was that angry. And I said, no, you've been great. And um, I'm trying to get off the phone now. And she says, well, if you have an extra minute, there's something I'd like to share with you. And I thought, well, this is like your sales pitch, or I have to take some dumb survey about how great you are, you know? And uh, I said, sure. And she said, I just wanted you to know that the sermon you gave at church yesterday was really powerful. And I was like, in my head, I didn't speak at the Philippines yesterday. Like, and then it hit me, this is not a person who's far away. This is a person who was in my town, and she recognized my name on the bulletin, matched the name on the statement, and she had listened to a sermon that I gave and knew the voice was the same. And I didn't know that. And y'all, do you have any idea how close I came to letting her have it in Jesus' name? And it reminded me that when you are faithful in the small things, man, God, God just blesses you. And you have no idea. And you know, sometimes the small, the, the, our culture doesn't like the small things. Do, they want the big things. And God's like, no, let's do the small things, and let's do them really well. And sometimes the small thing is simply just being kind to somebody because you never know who's on the other end of that call. The Greeks had a race in their Olympic games that were really unique, and the winner was not the runner who finished first. The, The winner was the runner who finished with his torch still lit. Man, how's your torch? How's your torch? Because, y'all, that's really what it's about. It's not about winning winning this race. Jesus took care of that. It's about finishing with the torch still lit. And I just pray, I pray today that we would be the people that would finish with our torch still lit. Let's pray.